Okay, everyone, sorry for the droning noise in the background. My husband is having fun with his yard equipment outside. Um, historians say that a Cold War emerged from World War II. It was cold because it wasn't hot. It didn't involve the actual firing of weapons, even though it involved very much the having of a lot of weapons and big armies and the threat to use them. The Cold War uh, really begins in 1945. It's between the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, very specifically as these two world powers opposed to each other who represent democracy and communism and each one perceiving the other as a direct threat to their existence. It lasted until 1989 in a very specific sense, probably uh, really ends more in the early 1990s. And so it dominates the second half of the 20th century. Um, you can talk to your parents about this. It dominated everything and dominated every aspect of everything that happened, everything political, a lot of stuff economic, like it was just the overriding factor of everything that happened in the second half of the 20th century. Germany was key to the emergence of the Cold War. It was literally divided by the Cold War because the occupying armies had come in to Germany, the occupying armies of the Allies, with the Soviets in the East here, and the Western powers, the Western Allies in the West of Germany. In 1946, Winston Churchill, who had been um, voted out of office recently in England, came to a small Missouri college in the United States, and he made a speech on these developments in Europe. And what he said was that an iron curtain had descended across Europe in general and Germany in particular. And this really came to be the metaphor for the Cold War. And it worked. Mr. Churchill always had had a way with words. Europe was divided. Germany was divided. Okay. Germany is divided. And you can see that the Iron Curtain extends straight down the middle of Germany, across between the Czech Republic and Germany and Austria, etc. And um, this is very much what it was about. So you remember from the last lecture, um, the Soviets never pulled out of Eastern Europe. Here's a great cartoon. Here's Mr. Churchill looking under it. This was an iron curtain. You couldn't see through it. You couldn't pass it. You couldn't go from one side to the other. And it was it was a complete it was a complete cutoff. And why to say there and while to say that there was absolutely no movement between east and west would be uh, an exaggeration. I mean, this is pretty much true. No admittance by order of Joe and the Americans and the, and the Western Europeans really weren't le interested in letting people come uh, the other way either. The United Nations had been formed in 1945 as part of the peace deals to come out of World War II. In fact, the big three had just decided upon it at Yalta. And um, so the, League, the United Nations was a dressed up League of Nations and it was supposed to be able to do what the League of Nations could not. It's going to have a little bit more power, a little bit more teeth. It was going to be a peacekeeping international body. And um, the United States joined and Russia joined and you have, you have all the big powers in it from the start. And so here's the Iron Curtain. And here's the United States and France. And you can see them here and they're trying. You try the United Nations. She was new new person on the on the block and uh, hoping hoping that early on in the immediate aftermath of the war that the UN would be able to affect some kind of uh, helpful resolution to the Cold War but it was not to be. Um, Greece, the United States, the new United States President Harry Truman was also quite unwilling to accommodate the uh, Joseph Stalin and the communists and quite unwilling to compromise with them. He was really sort of a black and white guy. And um, he saw a great deal of danger facing Western Europe in the immediate aftermath of the war, the danger of the spread of communism. And sure enough, 
1947, a civil war broke out in Greece between nationalist Greeks and communists. And we talked about the other day in class that there was a kind of a foiled communist uprising plan for Paris after its liberation, um, et cetera. So it's not like people in Western Europe were interested in communism. And there was the very real threat of communism um, coming to Western Europe. Greece had been occupied by Germany during the whole of World War II, and it had suffered a great deal of damage. And when the Germans left the war, the civil war breaks out. And so Truman uses this as a moment to make a statement. And so this is an American cartoon. And what we have here is the brave Greek nationalist, okay, you can recognize him by his dress, etc., defending Greece from communist threat. Uh, a symbol of the Soviet Union of Russia is the bear. So if you see the bear, that is a symbol of communism and specifically of uh, the, U the USSR, the Soviet Union. And here's this mean, menacing, nasty looking bear. He's threatening Greece and you have the very brave nationalists defending it. So this becomes an opportunity for the United States to um, promote uh, a very active anti-communist foreign policy. What became known as the Truman Doctrine was uh, born out of uh, this request that Truman makes to the United States Congress for money to help the Greeks, who the Greek nationalists, fight off communism. This became known as his doctrine that the United States would help directly or indirectly any nation that was threatened by communism. And um, so they helped the Greeks and with the help of American aid, the Greeks were able to establish a non-communist government. Communists lost that civil war. And so this is the American saying, look, you wanna spread the revolution? You wanna make the revolution worldwide? And we're gonna stand in the way of that. Now, one of you, very uh, cutely remarked in class the other day that you thought this was European history, not US history. Well, it's actually a pretty insightful comment. And we're going to see on the world stage post-World War II, because of the Cold War, a very active involvement of the uh, United States in foreign affairs. By 1947, the official policy of the United States as it pertained to the Cold War became this idea of containment. Something that's very important, and I think that these two cartoons illustrate very well, is that both the democracies, the Western democracies, and the Soviet Union saw each other as threats to their very existence. Okay, so you can see here, little Uncle Sam, and the mean bear, the USSR, it wants to spread its policy, it wants to spread communism everywhere. And we can see in this cartoon, mean, menacing Uncle Sam and the cute little teddy bear, the cute little teddy bear down here. The Americans trying to spread their way of life, threatening, threatening the other. And so the United States adopted, and so this was a very real world view. And so in 1947, the United States officially adopted this policy of containment. And the Truman Doctrine is, is part of this, that it would be the official policy of the United States to contain communism where it exists, to the places where it already existed. That the United States was not going to go into Eastern Europe, they were not going to go into Russia to try to overthrow the communists, but that the policy of the United States was going to be to contain it where it already existed, to keep it from spreading. In the late 1940s, the fear of communism spreading to Western Europe was very real. Western Europe was wrecked after the war. It was bombed. They had suffered staggering population losses. Did I mention that it was bombed out? Germany was bombed. England was bombed. France was bombed. Everywhere was bombed. They didn't have as many. They didn't have their factories. They didn't have bridges. They didn't have roads, any of that stuff. And to the Americans who were not bombed out, 
lots of losses, lots of casualties, etc. But it hadn't suffered the kind of physical damage that Europe had. The um, the fear was that with all of these hardships to overcome facing Western Europe, that communism would become an attractive option. And they feared the outbreak of more revolutions and more uprisings. And in addressing this, uh, American Secretary of State George Marshall, who you see here, he had been a general during the war, he was Secretary of State when he made this speech, talked about what the objective of the United States should be was to use its resources, because it had them and other places didn't, to slow down, stop, avert the spread of communism in Europe, make communism less attractive. And this grew into the Marshall Plan. Okay, Europe is bombed out and in bad shape after the war. They didn't have the consumer goods that they needed. They didn't have the food that they needed. And they lacked the ability to produce these things or recover productive capability for these things quickly in every way. And so the idea behind the Marshall Plan was that American investment in Western Europe would keep communism at bay, would help Europe to recover, and thus would uh, would keep communism away. So I like I like the umbrella that they're they're trying to protect, which would keep communism out. Um, here's some Marshall Plan uh, propaganda. Whatever the weather, we must move together. The Marshall Plan emphasized this idea of unity, that this was a fight for everyone, that recovery was something everybody was in together, and that the United States was on the team. They were on the team, and they were going to help the team. They were going to help everybody with what they had to do. And indeed, this turned into one of the most successful programs in the history of American foreign policy. There's some more propaganda. One rise, we all rise. They hit Germany hard with the Marshall Plan and hard with the propaganda there because life was a very, very hard and Germany was the front line of the Cold War. The Germans were, I mean, the, not the Germans, the Russians were right there. Um, the country was divided, etc. And so through the Marshall Plan, the United States gave to any country in Europe that wanted it, any country that was affected by devastation, by the losses of World War II, money and goods to assist them in their recovery. This is part of like we're all on the same team, we're all in it together idea. Um, one of the great hardships after World War II is the continuing shortages of of consumer goods and a great hardship existed in just lacking the ability to recover their productive capabilities quickly. And so here comes a shipment of cargo and we have some uh, diplomats here all watching the arrival under the Marshall Plan. Food, goods, cars, tractors, all kinds of things, you name it. The United States shifted over to Europe as part of the Marshall Plan. Shiploads of stuff arrived. I mean, I just tons and tons and stuff because the United States was the only country left with the industrial capability to produce stuff because um, we weren't bombed out. The U.S. wasn't bombed out. Europe was bombed out, and so American products arrived literally by the shipload. And Europe needed it. I think this photograph is very telling. Here's a, a worker. In Berlin, you can see the the uh, poster on the back, and you can see the devastation and the destruction. Europe was in bad shape. Okay, it was a mess. Not only goods, but cash flowed into Europe as a uh, part of the Marshall Plan. And I like this map for showing you uh, where money went to. And, and the United States was really generous. There weren't tons of restrictions. Like you've got Iceland and Norway and Ireland and, and countries that weren't even too directly involved in the war were able to get money. And the United States was a very, very purposeful in saying this was open to everybody, even the countries behind the Iron Curtain. Now they knew Joseph Stalin would say no. They knew he would not allow 
any of those countries to take money from the United States under the Marshall Plan, but they put him in a situation of having to be the bad guy. This money would, did not come in the form of loans, but as a gift. And again, we're gonna go back to this whole idea. We wanted to say, hey, we're all in this together. We're gonna to help you out. And um, this ended up, even though it was a huge expenditure on part of the United States, being incredibly beneficial to the United States from an economic perspective because the Europeans took this money and then they had to buy stuff from American companies while the rest of Europe recovered. I mean, they couldn't buy stuff from anywhere else. So the United States government sends all this money um, to Europe, all this stuff. A lot of it ended up going back to the United States to companies and, and to purchase goods. It really led to or helped to create an economic boom, it was part of what helped to create an economic boom in the United States after the war. And the Marshall Plan proved a great success, accelerating economic recovery in Europe and being and kind of thwarting um, the attractiveness of communism. He couldn't block it. Uh, Joseph Stalin did not allow Eastern European countries to participate in the Marshall Plan. He offered a communist alternative. It was called ComCon. It was uh, ComCon was the communist. Marshall Plan, if you will, but compared to uh, what the United States could offer under the Marshall Plan, it was really lacking. But the Soviet Union, Russia especially, of course, was in dire straits itself after the war and um, suffered a great deal in, in their attempts to recover, struggled, struggled a great deal in their attempts to recover. So this was the whole point of the Marshall Plan. And from this perspective, we can say that it worked pretty well. Keep pumping, keep going. You're gonna ride this bike by yourself. You can do it, you can do it. And so recovery in Europe was slower than it was in the United States, but it did eventually come. And by the mid 1950s, um, stability and prosperity, generally speaking, early to mid 1950s. Western Europe was, was generally stable and, and generally prosperous. Berlin um, emerged quickly in the Cold War, kind of be a flashpoint, kind of be a centerpiece, if you will, in the war as much as Germany was. Germany was the front line. Germany was divided west to the democracies, east to the Soviet Union. It was the front line of this. And Berlin which was the capital city of Germany, really became a sticking point, really became a flashpoint in, uh, in the situation. You will notice um, that Berlin is entirely within East Germany. I meant to show you that on the previous map and I didn't. It's really far inside East Germany. Berlin is really far East in Germany. It's almost in Poland and so, Berlin as a city was all the way inside the Soviet zone of occupation. And so Stalin wanted at Yalta to have exclusive control of Berlin. And he was accommodated a great deal at Yalta, but Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt were like, no, 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 we're going to divide Berlin. And so Stalin tried again at Potsdam, you know, I'll take care of Berlin. You guys don't have to say, oh no, no, we're going to stay in Berlin. And so in 1948, Stalin upped the ante on Berlin. Berlin was a problem for him. You can see here that the city was divided. And so West Berlin remained under the control of the Western democracies and technically remained free and open and part of Western Europe, even though it was surrounded by communism. It's like this little island of capitalism and democracy inside the communist ocean. And uh, this was really a problem for Stalin because if somebody got to West Berlin, they could get to Western Europe. It was it was this little, you know, access point and uh, what something he perceived as a very serious threat to his security. And so he moved in 1948 to force the Westerners out by cutting Berlin off. It's like you're not going to leave willingly. I am going to force you out. And so he established a blockade on the ground around Berlin and he threatened to shoot 
any truck or train, um, et cetera, that tried to pass the blockade. Now, this produced a problem for the um, British and the Americans and the French because they were put in the position of, of Berlin essentially being under siege. And if times became too tough in Berlin, the Berliners would want them to leave to ease the, to ease the pain. Things were already hard. This is only 1948. Things were already very difficult. And they wanted to keep the Western Berliners on their side. And uh, as the events unfolded, this really became very emblematic of the way that confrontations tended to go in the Cold War. So Stalin used tanks and trucks and soldiers to cut Berlin off on the ground and threatened to shoot any, any um, uh, Western vehicle, train, et cetera, that tried to run the blockade. And so if you can't go in on the ground, the Allies thought, hmm, let's try to go in through the air and let's see if he shoots the planes down. Loophole in the Berlin airlift was born. Um, the Americans and the British had kind of the early thought, well, like, let's try to go in, let's try to go in through the air and let's see if he shoots the plane down. Truman was committed to Berlin. He was not gonna let Berlin go. It was a point of pride, of emphasis for him. Um, Truman has survived very narrowly, very close re-election in 1948. And so this, this was a big deal. And so the planes started to fly in and the Russians didn't shoot them down. So they flew more planes in and this became known as the Berlin Airlift. The Western democracies essentially supplied West Berlin with all manner of food, heating equipment, whatever their consumer needs to help them survive the blockade, the siege on the ground. This is another win, I guess you would say, for the Westerners. It was a huge, huge effort. Um, as the blockade, as, uh, as the airlift kind of picked up steam, there are five airports in West Berlin and airstrips that they were using. Planes were coming in with increasing frequency and their efficiency increased to the point that hundreds were landing a day and uh, Berliners were hired to unload the planes and, and essentially enable them to turn around. And as you can see here, I mean, you're talking like planes were on the ground, generally speaking, for less than an hour. And uh, they were just coming in constantly and able to provide the city with uh, the things that it needed to keep morale up, keep the people in, etc. I like this picture, it really shows you just kind of the constant um, drama planes coming in. There's an American pilot who gained fame in Berlin and then in the United States when news media picked up his story for throwing trinkets and candy out the window of the cockpit. Uh, this was in a day when a pilot could slide a small window open in the cockpit. So he'd be coming in to Berlin and he would toss things out his window to groups of children. And so I love this picture. I love the enthusiasm of the kids, but you can see, look, look at the pile of rubble that they're standing on. The devastation of the war. Okay. And so uh, this went on, Captain Candy gained fame. Um, school kids all over the United States put care packages together, sent candy to air bases in France and in England for pilots to carry in treats for the children in Berlin. But mostly it wasn't treats, it was the necessities of daily life. Again, the whole point of the Berlin Airlift was to keep morale up in Berlin, to keep people supplied with the things that they needed. Here's a girl carrying her daily ration of bread out and um, eventually, you can say, the plan worked, okay? The plan worked. Um, after about nine months in the later part of 1949, Joseph Stalin ended the blockade of Berlin, okay? So he ended the blockade. So you say the Berlin airlift was a great success. And in that, in that regard, it was. But the, uh, 
um, Berlin remained divided and remains a really, I guess, sticky point in the Cold War. In 1949, under the leadership of the United States, the United States and Western Europe concluded what became known as NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This was a very involved defensive alliance. Okay, and what the NATO said essentially was that they were all, we're all in this together. And so the most important part of NATO is common defense. An attack on one was an attack on all. And so it's a way for uh, Western Europe and the United States to say to Russia, say to the Soviet Union, hey, you attack West Germany specifically, or any of these little countries around you, you know, you attack anybody, or if communism tries to spread anywhere, you're going to have the United States to deal with. Russia countered with the Warsaw Pact in 1955, a defensive alliance amongst the Soviet countries, the communist countries, um, which were known outside of Russia as the Eastern Bloc countries or the satellite states, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, etc., where communism had essentially been uh, enforced by Russian occupation after World War II. And so by the middle 1950s, the world, Europe, the Western world, was divided into two hostile and heavily armed camps. In 1949, necessitating NATO, of course, uh, the Soviet Union, much to the surprise and chagrin of the United States, successfully exploded an atomic bomb. Now, the United States had done this a couple of years before and had used those weapons against Japan uh, to end the war with the Japanese. And so the world got a glimpse of just how nasty they are, okay? And so for the first couple of years of the Cold War, the United States was like, well, we have an atomic bomb and they don't. They're not gonna mess with us because we can obliterate them. Well, lo and behold, 1949, the Soviets explode an atomic weapon. And this kicks off a very important component of the Cold War, which is an arms race. An arms race, they were always competing with each other. You have an atomic weapon, we're gonna have more. You're gonna build more, we're gonna build more. We're gonna look for new and more intricate weapons. And so there was this arms race that occurred in both sides, built up the military capability essentially to annihilate the world um, through nuclear war. Okay, they built up, they built up that, that capability. And that's essentially what, if the war between the United States and Russia ever got hot, if it ever turned into a war of weapons, that's what you're looking at, it was not guns, but nuclear weapons. Life in the Soviet Union was hard. Stalin was not a nice guy, okay? He was not a nice guy. Um, and life in the Soviet Union was hard. They were devastated during the Second World War and recovery was hard. In the Eastern countries, recovery in Russia mainly came at the expense of the Eastern countries, which Joseph Stalin literally robbed blind uh, of their resources and I mean literally like stole entire factories out of East Germany stuff like that to bring them back to Russia to help Russia rebuild and so I'm going to show you some pieces of propaganda here here's the marvelous Joseph Stalin leading the world and the many groups that comprise the Soviet Union and everybody looking well and happy the life was hard the devastation was everywhere but this picture to me is just so telling life was very hard in Russia after the war and the message from the communists was like hang in there we're gonna rebuild and then this is gonna be awesome okay we're gonna set all this right and this is gonna be awesome and you're gonna go with the program or you know, it's gonna be tough here's some more like pro collectivization propaganda that came out after the war as Stalin aggressively pursued art in the form of socialist realism. We talked about this briefly in the 1930s. We looked at socialist realism with uh, Stalin in the 1930s, Russia in the 1930s, and uh, Hitler and even the fascist used socialist realism, this really intense propaganda that supported the state and the whole point 
of this intense propaganda, this socialist realism, is that, hey, we are all in this together. We are all in this together and everyone is happy and this is the way to go. Okay. This, uh, again, you have the people. This is interesting. I keep calling it Soviet realism. It's socialist realism, but Soviet as it pertains particularly to the Russians here. This is strongly nationalistic, celebrating kind of tradition, Russian dress and culture and everything like that, but also promoting, again, this idea that things are groovy in the Soviet Union. Um, Stalin pursued after the war his five-year plans again and and this was not necessarily comfortable or happy for the people um, there were severe severe lack of consumer goods in the Soviet Union a consumer good again being the things that make life comfortable emphasis on their industrial recovery was on industry heavy machinery tractors you know the weapons of war all of that kind of stuff. And so people by and large did without the things like you know, clothes, shoes, and blankets that make that make life nice. Housing was in a severe, severe sh uh, shortage of housing, et cetera. But you look at the art, you would never, you would never see that. Um, Stalin became after World War II very forceful in enforcing communism and his communism, etc. And uh, while he was always hostile to critics or to enemies, real and perceived, um, he became increasingly so after the war and conducted uh, with greater frequency what were known as purges. And a purge means exactly what it sounds like, ridding Russia, the Soviet Union, of all enemies, real and perceived. Um, he kind of becomes like Robespierre in, in the terror, all right? The enemies of Russia, the enemies of communism, the enemies of the Soviet Revolution were people who maybe weren't enthusiastic enough. But he would go through these purges, and the people that were purged were almost always communists, okay? They were almost always communists but maybe they suggested a different idea or they lacked enthusiasm or something like that one of the great examples of this was the arrest and execution of a russian director and actor named mayor holds and i'm not even going to try his first name because i totally butcher it and that's embarrassing but mayor Hold, was famous in Russia. He was a famous actor. He was a very well-respected director. He was really kind of considered a treasure of the Soviet Union, a cultural treasure. And he was a communist. He was a communist and he had supported the Bolsheviks and the revolution and all this stuff. And so after World War II, you know, he had his own theater in Moscow and he had his own theater school. Like all these people love him. Okay, and so here's what happened though with Merhold. He had a different way of doing things. Stalin supported the art as long as it was socialist realism, whether it was paintings or posters or plays, etc. And you had to promote the message. And Merhold was a communist, so his work wasn't anti-communistic. And I'm, I don't want to get into all the details of how he was different, but he essentially was criticized and persecuted by the communist regime for the way in which he produced and directed plays. Okay, not what his plays were about, but the method in which he did them. And in 1939, he gave a speech at a conference of theater directors. And um, so this is even, even um, before, before the war, he gave a speech to the uh, conference of theater directors and he said, you know, that if we keep going down this path, we're going to eliminate art, right? We're going to eliminate art. And that's what he said, all right? So he didn't criticize communism or anything, but he's not being an enthusiastic supporter of it either. And um, he was arrested. 
and he was sent to a gulag. Remember, the gulags are like Russian concentration camps for political prisoners. And um, his wife, when his apartment was searched by intelligence forces, um, his wife was murdered. His wife was home then, and, and she was murdered during that um, um, circumstance. And so it was all pretty sad. And so this is kind of what the purges turned into. The, um, not enthusiastic enough, I would say. Uh, Stalin died in 1953. And we have learned in the years since the collapse of communism in the early 1990s that Stalin was responsible for the execution of approximately 20 million Russians. Um, for political offenses, for not being supportive enough or enthusiastic enough about himself and about communism. And so he's really the nastiest, bloodiest dictator in history. In the years after Stalin's death, uh, the new leader of the Soviet Union emerged, a man named Nikita Khrushchev. And he pursued, as we will look at next, a policy of de-Stalinization.